first? Well, I'm certainly not talking second. Oh, <laughs> damn it. Welcome back, Chris. Thank you. I'm uh, filling in for Michael. I want to make that clear. Okay, well soon, Mike. Yeah. This week we're going to be talking about a couple of different games. Uh, the first one's going to be a cartridge. It's a two-player game, uh, which is appropriate because Chris is in the room with me and we can play the game against each other. And this game is called Dog Patch. Dog Patch was a 1978 uh, CPU-driven midway game. You can play uh, against the computer in the arcade version, but on the Astrocade it's two-player only, which is sad for Adam. <laughs> He only says that because he beat me once. Well, we only played two games. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we're, I beat you 50% of the time, huh? Right. <laughs> Fair enough. So the arcade game that Chris was talking about, uh, something that, to mention, uh, while you can play two players, it's actually black and white only. Although somehow there's like a, um, a background. I'm not sure how it works, but it's a color background. Maybe it's set up kind of like the Space Invaders background. I think it is. I think it's being reflected off of a mirror obviously which mm -hmm. is good if you want to reflect anything uh inside the cabinet like the asteroids deluxe background you know so yeah. it's sort of floating looking like a dr seuss landscape maybe that's what dog patch looks like in the programmer's minds <laughs> three good old boys with nothing to do during a snowstorm in dog patch i say that because the background's all white and on the, the arcade ver or on the astrocade version on the, on the astrocade, arcade it's black right so maybe yeah. it's just they have Dark nothing, there. nothing to do at night or it's during in a long eclipse that could be. These three good old boys are shooting cans. The one in the middle is throwing them up in the air, and the two to the sides can shoot the can back and forth. And the players, um, we, you don't move your players. You just move your gun's position up and down. It's like half of the gunfight controls, if you'll remember that episode. I mean, if you don't, we could explain it. You, you, control, <laughs> you control your gun with a knob. Right. So you don't need the, uh, the actual joystick movement in Dog Patch. Yeah, that, you know, I hadn't thought about that before. That's interesting that you can't actually move your character left or right at all. So I do want to thank Arcade USA uh, for his YouTube video. Thanks, Willie. Uh, we watched your video, and that's how we got an idea of what the game actually looks like in the arcade. Because when you play it under MAME, there's no background, and it looks really plain. I mean, yes, it's black and white, but that's acceptable. But it looks so much better in the arcade, and if you ever get a chance to see it, that'd be great. Oh, speaking of the arcade, I want to be going to the Louisville Arcade Expo in March. If anyone's going to be out there, uh, let me know. Uh, maybe I'll try to meet up with you. Dog Patch for the Astrocade was released uh, originally by Bally uh, in 1980. It's a 2K cartridge. Um, it's part number uh, 2010, or 2010, I guess, like a Space Odyssey? No, that's 2001 A Space Odyssey, isn't it? 2010 was something. Yeah, it was the sequel. Another Space Odyssey. But this is a, the last game that was released by Bally. Um, it was later re-released, just a year later, by Astrocade Inc. And um, nothing changed except the packaging. Um, the original packaging for the Bally games they were basically just a stiff piece of cardboard with a folded over piece of paper that had a picture of what the game would look like. I don't think it was a screenshot. I think it was kind of like an artist's rendition of the game, too, which was kind of common back then. Uh, photographing screens was much more difficult at the time. They didn't quite have it down yet, so you'd get wavy lines and stuff. Yeah, that's true. You get to decide how many cans. You and uh, your almost identical but symmetrically... Opposite? Might, yeah, the guy on the other side of the screen and you uh, shoot cans back and forth. You can keep a can in the air as long as you can both shoot it. They're tougher than soda cans, is, is what we're saying, and that's why you don't obliterate it with one shot, because they look like shotguns. Yeah, they're supposed to be 12-gauge shotguns, according to the uh, the manual. Who the hell needs a 12-gauge shotgun to shoot a can? I was anyway? just thinking about that. Well, in the arcade, there was a wild goose. Yes, there's a bonus round or something like that? I don't know how it worked. In between, sometimes, in between cans, a goose flies out, and you can shoot it for 200 points. That's not included in the... Uh, the Bally version. Yeah, well, it's interesting when when I was looking at the, how the game uh, worked in that video. Uh, when the when the uh, goose gets shot, the wild goose, not a tame goose, just to let you know. Right. And when it when it falls down, it's, it actually reminds me very much of Duck Hunt on the NES on the oh. arcade, I guess too. It looks just like it hmm. in black and white version. I've anyway. never played Duck Hunt. What? Yeah. So when the game starts, 
um, it asks you for the number of players, or excuse me, it doesn't ask you for the number of players, and because there's always two. Uh, there can be one, but the other person isn't going to be shooting. Right, or you can <laughs> hold both controllers and... Yeah, good luck. Yeah, well, you know, Willie did that in his video. He actually played both at the same time That's somehow. Right. But as you saw, he didn't it didn't look very, very fun. Well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then it asks for the number of cans. You're gonna have, um, I guess, one or well, zero, but I don't maybe one, one to ninety nine. And the arcade game uh, it uses an eighty eighty, which seems kind of late to me for assist. I thought, you know, when we were looking at Mame, I thought maybe it would use a Z eighty, but it uses a eighty eighty running at two megahertz. And the Astrocade has a Z eighty that runs at uh, one point. Seven nine, I think. Impressively accurate conversion, except for the goose, which you don't really miss. Yeah. Every time one of you uh, blasts the can, you know it obviously goes off toward the other player, and then he can shoot it back. Every time you shoot it, you get a point. Whoever shoots the can last gets all of those points cumulatively the bonus points when and well this is called bonus and this is displayed at top center so every time either of you shoots a can that goes up and the last person to shoot it gets all those bonus points because that means the other guy missed it you know yeah, and you can make a big comeback that way too especially once you get a good volley going back and forth and I, that's what mm -hmm. makes this game fun i, I remember reading um because I, I i encountered this game really early on it was in my first uh, uh selection of stuff i had and there was um in cursor they come, when this game came out, they did a semi-review, like a paragraph, and they basically said, this game's for kids only. And I disagree with that. Really? Yeah, I do. I disagree. I think it's pretty fun. I think it would be a good kind of game to set up at like a, a, a classic gaming expo or something like that. Like two minutes, three minutes to play a game. And it's pretty fun. Well, it's more fun than Pong. How did that start, you wonder? Like, one of the guys called the other, hey, you want to go out can shooting? <laughs> well, let's see if Bob is ready to moderate, because there's a guy in the middle throwing the cans up. You oh, know? There is, they yeah. all go stand out in the field. Their wives maybe are watching from the sidelines. <laughs> go ahead, shoot that can, scooter. I don't know. <laughs> and I like the hats. Oh, by the way, the guy on the left, this isn't important, but the guy on the left is wearing a very, very orange suit with matching pumps it looked like <laughs> maybe jay fenton did write this and then the guy on the other side is i can't remember what you were wearing i'm orange or well okay so the player one is orange the yeah left the left player. side is orange and the right side is green green okay yeah, yeah. and the uh, astrocade when um the cannon goes up in the air uh, uh the guy in the middle well he doesn't say but it on the screen it says get ready boys oh yeah but uh the arcade version doesn't say that it says blaze away blaze away dude <laughs> All right, what else? What so I have a, um, a a little bit of history with this game that it's, I, I remember it very fondly because when I first started um, experimenting with the Astrocade and programming and disassembly work, um, this was the first one I tried. Um, I didn't know anything about how it really worked. I didn't know Z80 machine language or anything like that. But I was kind of learning as I went along, and I was disassembling this game by hand, and I didn't know how, to, how it interacted with the uh, ROM subroutines, so I was... When it'd make a call to a ROM subroutine, I was just like, I didn't know any better. I was just disassembling that, and I was getting stuff that made absolutely no sense whatsoever. And so I was getting some help from the Yahoo group and um, asking questions, and I discovered that... I guess I knew about the nutting manual before then, but I, I hadn't really read it. And the nutting manual is how the programmers at nutting um, programmed the Astrocade. So once I started to read the nutting manual, I got to grips with it a little more, and then I discovered disassemblers. And I, you couldn't just point it at a part in the code, even if you know where the game starts, which it doesn't start at the first byte because the way the Astrocade is set up the first byte for most games is um, just tells the system where to start executing code, but you have to know that by reading the nutting manual. So it's a, I learned a little bit at a time. And I was just assembling by hand, you know, longhand when I say by hand, not on the computer, writing down, you know, each hex digit, figuring out what that meant, looking it up in a table, what a pain in the ass that was. Uh, uh, so eventually I, I, I knew that disassemblers existed, but I just didn't really know how to get started with them. So I um, I got started with it um, and kind of never looked back. I mean, every once in a while I'll, I'll get a little bug and I'll decide I want to do a little bit of disassembly. But I did this in 2001 and, it, and I put it out there on the internet and it was on Valley Alley for six years. And then um, in 2007, uh, Richard Degler, who was a member of the Valley Alley Yahoo group, um, decided he wanted to finish disassembling it. And I disassembled like the graphic areas and part of the code. I didn't understand quite a bit. 
at that time still, especially how movement worked on the Astrocade. And Richard um, disassembled everything and commented this game heavily. And if anyone is interested in how the Astrocade works and wants to see a, a game that's commented completely, this is one of the few that's commented. Not the only one, but it's 100% commented. So you could look at this game, look at the Nutty Manual, and kind of get to grips with how to program the system. When you say by hand, you actually went through it on a printout? Yes. Yeah, so what, I, what I did at the time is I opened up a, a hex editor. And I uh, opened up the 2K file, I uh, printed it out, which is when you print out a hex, the 2K of hex, it's only like two or three pages. Um, but I think if I was to print this out like the disassembly, it's probably 30, 40 pages or something like that with, with comments and things like that. Right. Um, but yeah, I went through uh, and I looked at, I still have some of that stuff around. It's kind of interesting to look at. But And I, and I had a book called um, Programming the Z80. It was by Rodney Zacks. And it explains how to program, but there's also like these handy charts or tables that let you look at it like a hex digit, and then you can translate that into what its mnemonic is, which is kind of like... So now, I guess you have tools on the computer that weren't available to you at the time, right? Well, they were available, I just didn't know about them. Oh. Yeah. Um, in fact, I used tools, I mean, I used an, an assembler called ZMac, which was actually written in the 70s, and... Um, ZMac, that's exactly what I was thinking of, I just yeah. couldn't remember the name. So what other games did we play this evening? Oh, Jello. Oh, hyphen Jello. Othello, spelled differently. I wonder if there's any kind of story behind the name. Like, why a J? It's because when you beat me a little while ago, it's because you're a jerk. You know everything about programming the Astrocade. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, it is indeed a very faithful, very good version of Othello. Written in basic. Written in basic, so it's uh, impressively fast for basic. And it's written by Clyde Perkins. It was published in uh, the March 1980 uh, issue of the Arcadian Newsletter. Um, the instructions were on page 38, and the one page of programming, which wasn't very long, um, was on page 41. So you were saying Clyde Perkins was the father of John Perkins, who designed the Blue Ram. Yes. And had been a rocket engineer. Yes. This, while this game is a basic game, we played this from uh, Ken Lil's uh, Multicart. It's, it's actually called Ken Lil's Ulti Multi Multicart. Oh. So this game, uh, and there's quite a few games on there that were never released as cartridges. Um, well, they sort of were by homebrew people, type people in the 80s. And this is one of those. And so it was originally a type-in, which, you know, you could type in, save to a tape. But, you know, you have to... Originally it was for Ballet Basic only, so it was written in 300 baht Ballet Basic. So it would probably take about three minutes to load. So uh, having the convenience of loading it from uh, a cartridge, uh, obviously much faster, instantaneous, basically. Um, uh, the way it works with the Ultimate Multicart is you put the dip switches to the game for Ojello, which is an Astro Basic game, and then it basically loads it into memory and it tells you, okay, now put it, switch all the dip switch positions to one, which is going to be Astro Basic, and then it automatically, or press equal, and then the game will start. Now, this is not how Ojello originally played. Um, it didn't start that way. You would just load it in like a normal basic program by typing colon input. But in this case, it makes it... We wouldn't have played it tonight otherwise. I, we didn't... We didn't... We weren't going to load any games from tape. I thought it was impressive we were playing a basic game from a multi-cart to begin with. Yeah. You know, and I think it's cool how... Correct me if I'm wrong, you load the game in and then you activate Astro Basic. Yes. That's and exactly somehow that's the game is not wiped out from memory when that happens. So is basic at a different part in memory? Well, basic is in the cartridge, and they, the, the game has been put on into the screen RAM, which you have to remember is shared. Oh, so right. So that's, how it, that's how it works. keep forgetting you can save code on the screen. That yeah. is so cool. Now, did Clyde Perkins himself rewrite it for Astro Basic? It probably worked. Um, there's nothing really... There's not much that would have had to be rewritten for this. Like usually, if there's a like complicated graphics or definitely sound, the sound between Ballet Basic and Astro Basic, you always had to do a conversion. This is actually can be played with one person. Yeah, and I found that really impressed. One page of Basic, and somehow he got some computer AI in there. Yeah, and it's not. It plays a pretty good game. You jump over your opponent's pieces, as in checkers, but that's where the similarity ends. In, in jumping your opponent's pieces, you change them to the color of your pieces, and you're trying to fill up the board with your color. And while the computer's playing, um, it actually uh, it shows you the space on the, on the grid. It'll put a little dot in the square it's looking at, and it moves the dot along maybe probably quicker than once per second. That's a good point. It shows you its progress, yeah. so you don't have to wonder. Like on the Atari, in Atari VCS Othello, 
And we also um, uh, videotaped, videotaped? Yeah. Wow, when was I born? <laughs> I also made a video of us doing this. I just pointed my camera to the screen. So I'm gonna upload those um, to YouTube probably next week or something like that. So you'll get to see if you're interested uh, how uh, the game is played against the computer and how great of a player I am. And uh, we also did the same with Dogpatch. So uh, we, I try to do that for some of the uh, more recent episodes I've done. And uh, I think it's kind of helpful because most Astrocade games don't have videos, especially basic games, they don't. While searching for some end theme music for this episode, I happened to find some audio that I'd completely forgotten about. I came across Clyde Perkins' spoken word introduction and documentation for Ojello. Paul Thacker had recorded this when he was archiving Ojello from a tape, and it was added to BallyAlley.com. I found the recording so neat that I even transcribed Clyde's audio on September 27, 2012. Clyde sent this tape to Bob Fabris of the Arcadian Newsletter so that he could print the basic listing, and also he sent it to Steve Wilson in Cleveland, Ohio, so that he could review the game. You know, I don't actually know if he ever did. Here is how the tape for Ojello is set up. Before the basic program, there is one minute spoken introduction. After the Ballet basic program finishes loading, there are six minutes of spoken documentation that explain the game. This documentation is meant to be listened to with the game playing on the television. There is a special appeal to hear the spoken audio from Clyde who, as I understand it, passed away sometime in, I think, the 1980s. This audio was recorded as a WAV file from a cassette tape 32 years after it was originally taped by Clyde. You can listen to it all on BallyAlley.com or read the transcription that is available there. I'll put links to both of those in the show notes, of course. One last thing. In his introduction, Clyde credits Peter Mag's article in the November 1979 issue of Byte Magazine for inspiring Ojello. I checked, and this article is called Programming Strategies in the Game of Reversi. I found a PDF of the issue of Byte Magazine, printed the piece, and skimmed it. It's a rather in-depth eight-page article that covers the topics of programming a game of Reversi generally, but there is also a two-page printed basic listing for implementing the game in basic on a SOL 20 computer with 16K of RAM. It's interesting to note that the Bally Arcade only has 1.8K of RAM, so Clyde really had to trim down the code and the array usage to get it all crammed into Bally Basic. He may also have simplified how smart the program is when playing it. For me, little nuggets of information like this, which are nearly lost to the ages, make the Astrocade a fantastic system to use after all of these years. I hope you enjoy listening to Clyde as much as I did earlier today. This tape contains a program in Bally Basic for a one or two player game I call Ojello. It was inspired by an excellent article in the November issue of Byte by Peter Maggs. It is a board game about a hundred years old called Reversi, recently marketed under the registered trademark Othello. Rules for the game are as simple as checkers, but playing strategy can be as complex as chess. Let's take a look at the board. I'll give you about 10 seconds to prepare to input the program. When it automatically runs and asks how many players, stop the tape and input a one followed of course by go. When you see the cursor blinking in the center of the board, start the tape again. Here we go. Move the cursor to an empty square next to a black piece in such a way as to enclose the black piece between the cursor and one of the white pieces already on the board. Now pull the trigger. All right, well, thanks for listening, guys. Uh, I think that's going to wrap up this episode. I'm going to try to get this one out, um, and maybe I'll try to record it next week or so um, with the other co-hosts, and we'll get something wrapped up that's going to be a longer episode for next time. In the meantime, you can, uh, if you want to contact me, you can reach me at ballyalley at hotmail.com. The end of show music for this episode of the Bally Alley Astrocast is Chopsticks, uh, which is taken from Wavemaker's Music Keyboard, a basic program that allows you to create two voice music using an on screen piano keyboard. Uh, the music could uh, then be exported to tape and then used in your own program. Music Keyboard was released uh, in December 1982 on tape number 17. It was also uh, released on Wavemaker's Tape 19 and released without this music that you're about to hear, Chopsticks, um, on Astro Bugs Club Tape Number 1. It was later reprinted in the Arcadian um, in February 1983, but they accidentally left out a, an array that would make the program work, which they ended up printing in the next issue, in the March 83 issue. I was curious about this well-known song. 
And here's some neat information that I'm quoting from the mentalfloss.com website. The short article by Stacy Conrad is called History's Greatest One-Hit Wonder. She says, Choptics is probably the world's best known waltz. Yes, it's a waltz. The ditty was penned in 1877 by a 16 year old girl named Euphemia Allen, who called it the celebrated chop waltz. Her brother, a music publisher named Mozart Allen, yes, his name was really Mozart, helped get the sheet music on store shelves under the pseudonym Arthur de Lully. The music included instructions to, quote, play with both hands turned sideways, the little fingers lowest, so that the movement of the hands imitates the chopping from which this waltz gets its name. All right, enjoy the song. So when the game is displayed, you've got this basically a rectangle. It's well, a whole bunch of little squares are drawn on screen, which you can put your pieces in. Otherwise known as a grid. Uh, thank you, Chris. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> oh, well, we, at least I know now to get away from the mic. You jump over your opponent's pieces, as in checkers, but that's where the similarity. Is that a word? Similarity? Of course it's a word. Would you forget your brain at your house today? <laughs> Evidently, man. What was in that coffee you gave me? <laughs> of course it's a word. <laughs> I think I'm lightheaded from laughing. Ends. That's where the similarity ends. The game is over when neither player can play. Press any key to run it again. <laughs> 